from ABC News, 25 on 2020. Good evening, I'm Barbara Walters, and tonight, a program that's been 25 years in the making. And that was only last month. Don't I wish. Tonight marks a beginning and an end. As of next month, I will be leaving the anchor position on 2020 to concentrate primarily on specials here at ABC. But nothing has been more special for me than these past 25 years on 2020. I have done approximately 740 interviews, including almost every notorious murderer. Well, that's something for me to be proud of. On the other hand, I've also interviewed every first lady and president since Richard Nixon, and lots of movie stars and some sensational scandals. Do the names Monica and Martha ring a bell? So join us as we celebrate what we're calling 25 on 2020. But first, let me take you back just a bit more than 25 years. I had been appearing on NBC's Today Show with Hugh Downs, covering anything and everything from the serious... These are the honor guards of President Kennedy. ...to the silly. I enjoyed seeing you as a buddy. Thank you. After 13 satisfying and productive years, ABC made me an offer in 1976 to be the first female co-anchor of an evening news program. Harry Reisner. Barbara Walters. Bring you the news. It was an enormous challenge and honor. And besides, I had a seven-year-old daughter, and it meant we could finally have breakfast together. The mornings were wonderful. The evenings were not. These are going to come and go. My partner was a well-respected newsman named Harry Reisner. Three seconds to camera three. He certainly wanted to do the news every night. He just didn't want a partner, no less a woman. And he made that clear from the very first night. Mr. Reisner? Thank you, Barbara. I've kept time on your story than mine tonight. You owe me four minutes. <laughs> and it was all downhill from there. Eventually, the audience said, enough. And so did ABC. Harry went to CBS, and I began to work my way back up the ladder I had fallen off of here at ABC. This is Barbara Waters in Cairo. This is Barbara Waters in Panama. We have heard reports... For the first time in this interview, yes, our At the British Commonwealth Conference here in London... In California, it is still too close to call at this point. In a way... Having to work my way back was perhaps the best thing that could have happened to me, for I was able to be present at times when history was being made. In 1977, the biggest story was that the president of Egypt, Anwar Sadat, and the prime minister of Israel, Menachem Begin, two fierce enemies, were going to meet. From that initial meeting came a peace treaty between Egypt and Israel that still stands today. In November of 1977, Anwar Sadat flew from Egypt to Israel, and I was on his plane. The next day, they sat down with me for their first ever joint interview. So that there might be a ray of light, there might be some concession, there might be a somewhat different position down the road. <laughs> Uh, you are always like this. <laughs> I went on to interview other controversial heads of state, like the Shah of Iran and Fidel Castro. But I wanted a home. So in 1979, I joined ABC's premier news magazine called 2020 with my old partner from the Today Show, 
Hugh Dodge. Barbara, I must say it's nice to share the desk with you again. It's lovely to see you again in much better hours, don't you think? <laughs> I think so. I couldn't have been happier, even though I was a great target, especially on Saturday Night Live from comedians who were better at being me than me. In my years at 2020, <laughs> I've interviewed dozens of influential stars and politicians, and I'm known for getting into the hearts of my subjects. Okay, Barbara, why do you think that you would be the best person to do this interview? Well, I'm nurturing sensitive, well-respected, and the camera loves me. I'm Barbara Wawa, and tonight we'll be talking to an actual living legend, the incredible Marlena Deutschwen. Well, I guess they were funny. When we come back, some very serious and perhaps frightening people. Why did you kill John Lennon? I wasn't killing a real person. I killed an image. I killed an album cover. Next. What about marriage? If you fell in love, oh, look, your whole face changes. No marriage. <laughs> uh -huh, that's my answer. Yes. <laughs> no marriage ever, no matter what. Yeah! Over the past 25 years, I've come face to face with some of the most infamous people in this country. Men and women accused or convicted of murder. Their stories are complicated, violent, and undeniably fascinating. We begin with the murder of one of the most famous celebrities of the 20th century. Who got shot? John, so Lennon. John Lennon. Man, he was a big a white man. Cops pulled John Lennon out and put him into the back of the police car. Uh, he was shot by an unknown at this time. The assassination of John Lennon in 1980 was a shocking event that left a permanent mark on all of us. His killer, Mark David Chapman, became one of the most hated men in the world. Chapman described himself as a nobody. We spoke at Attica Prison in his first television interview. Chapman's account of why he murdered John Lennon right outside his New York City apartment was chilling. Why did you kill John Lennon? I thought by killing him, I would acquire his fame. I asked Satan to give me the power to kill John Lennon. Bring me back to December 8th, 1980. So I'm sitting there. It's dark, and this limo pulls up. I heard this voice. Not an audible voice, but an inaudible voice saying over and over, do it, do it, do it, do it. I guess that was me inside. And I pulled the 38 revolver out of my pocket, and I fired at his back five steady shots. He then offered an apology for what he had done. I wasn't killing a real person. I killed an image. I killed an album cover. Took away a genius. Took away somebody's husband, somebody's father. But I am sorry. And I mean that. I am sorry. I'm sorry. But what about a man who offers no apology, who freely admits that he takes lives, but out of compassion? He's been called Dr. Death. Dr. Jack Kevorkian gained national attention when he began helping patients take their own lives using his so-called suicide machine. Doctor, how long does it usually take before they die? They go to sleep rather calmly and uh, without pain, as a rule, in, uh, in about a minute. And uh, they're unconscious after that, and uh, it takes about another six or eight minutes for breathing to stop and uh, two or three more minutes for the heart to stop. Dr. Kevorkian said he offered dignity and an escape from pain to people suffering from disease. His crusade forced the country to confront the still controversial issue of assisted suicide. What do you say to people who say, Dr. Kevorkian, you are playing God? A doctor 
always plays God, even when he gives you a pill, because he's interfering with a natural process. Dr. Kavokian says he assisted in at least 130 deaths, but it wasn't until 1999, after four trials for separate cases, that he was convicted. One is guilty of lesser charge of second-degree murder. He will be eligible for parole in 2007. Dr. Kavokian caused a national debate. This man, a national crisis. March 30th, 1981. John Hinckley Jr. shoots President Reagan, his press aide Jim Brady, and two others. Hinckley was 25, the youngest son in what seemed a picture-perfect all-American family. At the time, there was outrage when John Hinckley Jr. was found not guilty by reason of insanity. How does a child grow up to shoot a president? After two years of anguished silence, his heartbroken parents, Joanne and John Hinckley Sr., finally talked about their son, his schizophrenia, and the mistake they made practicing tough love when he was withdrawn and depressed. When I told him that he couldn't come home, um, he just couldn't understand it. He couldn't believe it. And I gave him um, what cash I had in my pocket. And... Um, suggested that he go to the YMCA to get a room, which he didn't want to do. And I said, okay, you're on your own. And um, so we parted ways, and that was the last I saw of him until after the shooting. At the trial, you said, it's my fault. I sent him out when he couldn't cope. It's my fault. And then you burst into tears. Do you think it's your fault? I didn't think about mental illness. And um, I sent a helpless human being out into the world to try to cope when he was totally unable to cope. After 21 years in a mental hospital, Hinckley was granted permission to make unsupervised home visits with his parents. The relationship between a man and a woman is often at the center of a crime and sometimes involves the most unlikely of murderers, like Jean Harris, a reserved and once highly regarded schoolmistress. In 1980, she was accused of the murder of her lover, the doctor, famous for the Scarsdale diet, Herman, or High Tanawa. She said it was an accident and that she was trying to kill herself. What would you most want people to know about you? that I didn't murder her. Hundreds came to see Jean Harris in court every day, a trial that produced months of steamy headlines across the country. Tanawa had been having an affair with a younger woman, and when Jean Harris shot him to death, to many she became the symbol of a woman wronged. But she was found guilty and sentenced to 15 years to life in prison. You would think she would hate Dr. Tanawa, but when I interviewed her in prison, her reaction amazed me. Do you still love him? Yes. Do you think about him? Oh, no. Uh, I shan't. I shan't. I shan't. Let's talk about your life a little bit here, all right? I think about him constantly. It's one of the reasons I don't care if I get out, actually. I can't imagine what it would be like out there without him. This is that stupid. In 1993, after serving 12 years in prison, her sentence was commuted, and we sat down to talk once more. Harris said she no longer thinks of Tanawa. She said she now devotes her life to helping female inmates maintain contact with their children. We're not quite done with the dark side. In our second hour, the Menendez brothers, who killed their parents. Actor Robert Blake. Did he kill his wife? And, of course, O.J. Simpson. More murder stories from my personal crypt. But next, some of the most powerful leaders in the world. And I know you are a very private man. But we hear that you have five wonderful sons. It's prohibited to go into my personal life. Grandchildren. It's not our way. It's my private life. I tried. Next. I tried. It's my human.
What's the best piece of advice oh, you've given your children? Early to bed, early to rise. <laughs> Work like hell and advertise. As a journalist, interviewing the most powerful leaders in the world is at once exciting and a responsibility. You hope to reveal not just their politics, but their personalities. And it can be a delicate and unpredictable journey. Is it true that we are the first Americans to cross the Bay of Pigs in 16 years? As I remember, it's the first time. Fidel Castro and I met at the Bay of Pigs in 1977. This was the site of the American invasion of Cuba, launched 16 years earlier by President Kennedy. Do you feel funny crossing the Bay of Pigs with an American? With friends, America. With friend, America. American, American friends, is yes. A friendship relation. It's a friendly relation. Well, it's a very. You didn't come here to invade the country. When we actually sat down for a formal interview, it lasted three and a half hours. That was a lot of cigar smoke. I then traveled the country for 10 days with President Castro and a camera crew. The report aired for an hour on ABC and made news, but finished a distant third in the ratings far behind the detective show, Barnaby Jones. In Cuba, however, they aired the program for three and a half hours. There was no competition. 25 years later, we met again in Havana. I'm happy to see you. You look very well, a little more gray. I'm a little more blonde. Another late night, but no cigar. I've not been smoking for 17 years now, but you don't look like 25 years have passed. You look exactly the same. You are saying this, so I will not ask tough questions. But I tried. Do you allow demonstrations at all? And do you allow them? Do you allow them? Here we don't have them. But do you allow them if someone wanted to? Why do we need to prevent anything that doesn't happen at all? You wouldn't let it. Why do we need to prohibit something that doesn't exist, Barbara? But you don't let it happen. You won't allow it. Fidel Castro has been in power for 45 years. This man has been waiting for power all of his adult life. Prince Charles, now 55, was 36 years old when we met for a rare interview at Kensington Palace. Then, as now, he was struggling with his role as heir to the throne. I recall an interview you did in which you said that you felt sometimes the need to justify your own existence. Oh, yes. Yes, yes. Uh, otherwise, I might just sit back and... and uh and believe what people tell me, you know, how marvelous you are, oh, and this, that, and the other. You have to say to yourself, you know what, I'm not that marvelous. <laughs> well, yes, I think that otherwise you get big-headed. And, and you need to administer a, a little bit of self-kicking occasionally, you know, just to remind yourself. The royals may reign in Great Britain, but the politicians govern. The country's longest serving prime minister in the last century was also the first woman to ever hold the job, Margaret Thatcher. I interviewed her many times over the 11 and a half years she was prime minister. Our saddest conversation took place in 1991 after her own party turned the so-called Iron Lady out of office. She had a hard time letting go. It's the habits of years which get you, you the telephone goes and immediately you, you, you think, oh, goodness me, the United Nations is sitting, I wonder what's happened. You know, it's... Um, and then you realize. Then realize it was no longer me anymore. There's a lesson here. No matter how high you rise, prepare yourself for the time when it may be over. This man had risen to the top of the ladder when we met in Beijing in 1990. Zhang Zemin was China's leader. We talked just a year after a bloody uprising and massacre in Tiananmen Square. In the middle of the interview, I surprised Zhang Zemin with a picture that had been shown all over the world, but not in China. You know, sometimes things become symbols. Mm -hmm. In our country, there was a picture of a young man stopping tanks. We showed it again and again on our news. This was the picture that we showed in America. Mm -hmm. Do you have any idea what happened mm -hmm. 
to this young man. Mm -hmm. We understand that his name is Wang Wei Lin. Wang Wei Lin. Yes. <laughs> Do you have any idea what happened to him? Uh, well, I can't confirm whether this young man you mentioned was arrested or not. Mm, but I think never, never killed. Ne you think he was ne never I killed? I think never killed. The fate of that young man is still unknown to us, but he remains a symbol of the bloody uprising in Tiananmen Square, now part of China's history. In 1989, I found myself sitting across from the man who had been called the mad dog of the Middle East, Libya's Muammar Gaddafi. He had a reputation for cruelty and ruthlessness. We sat in a tent, surrounded by armed men, in a country where his whim was law. And after taking a deep breath, I asked this question. Can I ask you something very directly, which may seem rude? In our country, we read that you are unstable. We read that you are mad. <laughs> you know that those things have been printed. Does it make you angry? I... Uh consider or do believe that the majority of the ordinary people in the four corners of the globe do love me. Another very controversial figure at the time was Russia's president, Boris Yeltsin. We asked political questions, but many people were more curious about his personal life, which Russian leaders had always been reluctant to discuss. Do you discuss your decisions uh, with Mrs. Yeltsin? Yes. No. Well, that took care of that. <laughs> Boris Yeltsin may have championed democracy at the Kremlin, but not at home. Well, in our family, I'm the boss. <laughs> oh, wait till they hear this in America. This may be, this may be the most difficult thing. In your family, you are the boss. You are a dictator. In our family, it so happens that I'm the boss. Interviewing Yeltsin required another deep breath question. I must ask you something that is a rather a sensitive subject. The rumor lingers. Do you drink too much? Yes. No. Yes, on holidays. Yes, sometimes when I meet my friends from my college days, but otherwise, no. And I believe that, even judging by the way I look, you can see that it's true. Then there was this question to Yeltsin's successor and former top spy, Vladimir Putin. I'm going to ask you a terrible question. Did you ever order anyone killed? No. In fact, my work was more intellectual, political information gathering, analysis and so forth, so thank God, nothing like that happened to me. Actually, this, this intersection, Kelly and 163rd, was uh, the center of my life. Center Sound of my music? Life. I remember loud music from Tell the old something. days. One man who knows Vladimir Putin very well is our current Secretary of State, Colin Powell. He had retired from the army in 1993, and people were talking about him for president. We did a one-hour profile starting in his hometown, the Bronx, New York, a place where he had even learned Yiddish. Give me some uh, expressions. Uh, the Zuten Kappel. That means, God bless, bless your head. head. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Somebody said you've been milking that ever since, those yes, two Yiddish expressions. Yes, every chance I get. <laughs> We also returned with Powell to Fort Benning, Georgia, where in 1958 he had been a second lieutenant. Coming onto an army post, uh, you, you never saw anything. It was a fully integrated society. But off base in uh, those days, 1958, before the great civil rights legislation of the mid-60s, uh, this was this is Jim Crow land. There was segregation everywhere. What did you say to yourself? This is not my problem. Hmm. The problem lies with the person who is displaying the racist attitude toward me or is discriminating against me. Red phone for the president? Red phone, well, the red phone, normally for Colin Powell. During the first Gulf War, when Colin Powell was chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Norman Schwarzkopf was the commanding general in the field. This is where it all happened. I visited him in 1991, just as hostilities ended at his secret underground headquarters in Saudi Arabia. Sit in that chair right there. What you have up here is, uh, we were generally... General Schwarzkopf showed me his war room, previously off-limits to cameras, but he also showed me a side of himself unusual for a warrior. Well, there are certain questions I ask you, and the tears come to your eyes. I didn't know it showed. 
the old picture of generals. Generals don't cry. Generals don't get tears in their eyes. Sure they do. They just didn't admit it? Oh, I think they admitted it. Grant, after Shiloh, went back and cried. Lincoln cried. Uh, I don't think, and, and, and frankly, any man that doesn't cry scares me a little bit. I, I don't think I would like a man who was incapable of, 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 of enough emotion to, to get tears in his eyes every now and then. I, that, that type of person scares me. That's not a human being. So even generals cry. Throughout my career in 2020 and my specials, I've often been accused of deliberately trying to make people cry. Believe me, I really never want to do that. People. I'm not sure I can handle this. I'm going to cry in a minute. Uh, you're going to get me to cry? <laughs> no, I won't let you. Now you're going to make me cry, Barbara. No, this is I'm terrible. Not. God, you're going to make me cry. No. Are you going to tell people I made you cry? <laughs> you are. She's an evil woman. <laughs> Okay, dry your tears and get ready for some famous faces and memorable moments. How do you feel when they call you? Yeah, wacko jacko. I have a heart and I have feelings. I feel that when you do that to me. It's not nice. I'm not a wacko. When 25 on 2020 continues, after this from our 87 News. Introduced to Prince Charles and Camilla and I told Camilla she had nice You didn't. I did. Tell me what you said. <laughs> I felt them too. You did. <laughs> I did. You felt her bosom? Yes. Because she had a big cleavage and they were pushed way, way up. And I was just fascinated by her cleavage and I told her that she had nice teeth. And she said, Oh, thank you. Did she really? Yeah. I feel fortunate to have a job that's put me in the presence of kings and queens and princes. But there's also America's so-called royalty, the great performers and entertainers of Hollywood. I've given quite a few of them a twirl as well. One, two, three. One, two. One, two, three. Close your eyes. Oh, geez. You come a lot to these dances? <laughs> That's as far as I'm happy again. Ah, those were my dancing days. All of them done for what are still called the Barbara Walters specials. In the early days, most of my celebrity interviews were done just for my specials, but later I did my fair share on 2020. Last year, one of Hollywood's greatest legends, Katherine Hepburn, passed away. Although she said she detested interviews, we spoke four times. During our first interview 23 years ago, we discussed issues that concerned me and many other women. I asked her if she thought a working woman could also have a successful marriage. If I were a man, I would not marry a woman with a career. I wouldn't be that big a fool. I'd want her to be interested in me. Not the career. And a career is fascinating. I don't know what the so hell the women are going to do. So you have to make the choice. I think you bloody well better make the choice. Well, what do you I think mean, of I mean, I put on pants 50 years ago and declared a sort of middle road. You know, but I mean, I have not lived as a woman. I have lived as a man. How? And in a few, well, I've just done what I damn well wanted to, and I made enough money to support myself. And I ain't afraid of being alone. Is that why also you wear pants? No, I just wear pants because they're comfortable. Do you ever wear a skirt, by the way? I have one. You have one? Wear it to your funeral. <laughs> You'll wear it to my funeral. <laughs> I'd be delighted to know that they're coming. You don't want to know the day. I tell my friends, yes. <laughs> By the way, at my funeral, or perhaps in my obituary, it may mention that I once asked Catherine Hepburn what kind of a tree she wanted to be. Well, that's not exactly what happened. I'm a very strong, I've become a sort of, you know, thing. 
What? I don't know what, you know, some you tree or something. Yes. Wait, let's see that again. Some you want tree or something, yes. Well, so I didn't ask her, she brought it up. What was I to do? Right. What kind of a tree are you? Would you think you're a tree now? Oh, I like that everybody would like to be an oak tree. That's very strong and very pretty. From the Grand Dame to a legendary child actor, Macaulay Culkin became America's youngest superstar after appearing in Home Alone. But he ended up hating his father, who had pushed him relentlessly. Ah! Your father was described as the father from hell. Oh, yes, yes. My father was very good at uh, breaking people's spirits and holding them down. I mean, you have to remember that I was only 9, 10, 11, 12. I mean, I had no say. I've done 14 films. I've never read one of the scripts. Study the lines, go out there, and then, uh, and then just do it. So there was no fun. It was just study, spit it out, study, spit it out. Basically, basically. I really didn't want to do it anymore. I was hoping, literally, I was hoping to disappear off the face of the earth. <laughs> asked if I've ever interviewed Michael Jackson and the answer is yes we spoke seven years ago in Paris how do you feel when they call you wacko, yeah, wacko jacko. jacko where'd that come from some English tabloid I have a heart and I have feelings I feel that when you do that to me it's not nice don't do it I'm not a wacko I'm Jackson there are those who would say that you add to the attention no, I don't. Well, the masks, the, the mysterious behavior. There's, no, there's no mysterious behavior. I can't go in the park, though. So I create my own park in Neverland, my own water space, my movie theater, my theme park. That's all for me to enjoy. But you are somewhat eccentric, to say the least. The way you dress, the way you look, it invites attention. You don't think that calls the paparazzi to you? No. No? No. No, maybe I like to live that way, maybe I like to dress that way. I don't want paparazzi, really. But if they come, be kind. Write the right kind thing to write. Today, Michael Jackson is still hoping for a little kindness and support from the public. I love my fans, I love my fans. As he faces trial on child molestation charges. We'll have more celebrities, famous and infamous, later in the program. But next the most important story I have covered in the past 25 years. I saw a man uh, jump out of the top of the uh, World Trade Center, just hurl himself out the window. I said to myself, we are in something now that is totally different than anything that we've ever imagined before. Next. See. <laughs> Once again, Barbara Walters. Tuesday, September 11th, 2001. It will forever be remembered as the most traumatic and frightening of days. On September 11th, the country was in a state of panic and shock. All day long, each of us covered the story in our own way. There were many heroes on that day, but the man who became the symbol of courage and dedication was New York Mayor Rudolph Giuliani. He was everywhere. Then just days after the attack, an exhausted Giuliani sat down with me in the early hours of the morning for his first television interview. If I asked you, what are your most searing memories? As I say that, what comes into your mind? I don't, I don't even know what comes first. Seeing the man jumping from the top of the World Trade Center, um, hearing an airplane overhead, and first having someone yell out, there's another airplane attacking, and then having someone else say, it's one of ours. At every daily press conference, you have to give the statistics about the numbers. And the number of missing is 5,097. That we have How now. tough is it to be the messenger? It's uh, impossible. You just do it. The reality is that um, we, we can live through it. Courage is realizing that you're afraid and still acting. 
Three months later, he invited me to ground zero. They've removed over a million tons of debris. Unbelievable. Does it ever lose its impact? Do you ever get used to it? No. Uh, I, no, I don't, think, I don't think it has. I think every time I come down here, there's always a sense of shock. There's always a point at which you look at it and you're devastated by it. For the reporters covering 9-11, the human agony was something we found again and again. Everyone had a horror story. Windows on the World was the famous restaurant on top of the World Trade Center. I spoke with the owner, David Emile, and families of his missing employees. They, like so many, were struggling to come to terms with the personal loss. Mr. Emile, how many people do you think you have lost? We think we, uh, um, we're missing about 50 people. We think we lost 50 people. We're not exactly sure. And we would like it if the employees who are safe could get in touch with us. Tina, it is your sister who is missing. Yes. Your beautiful sister. Yeah, and she's only 36 years old. And she has a baby, a daughter, 10 years back home in Ghana. What will you tell this child, if you have to, about her mother? Honest to God, I don't know. Six months later, in an effort to understand the origins of the hate that caused 9-11, I traveled to Saudi Arabia, the homeland of 15 of the 19 hijackers and the birthplace of their leader, Osama bin Laden. It was a mysterious world. We traveled south and found Mohammed al-Shiri, the father of two of the hijackers, who was unable to accept the awful truth about his sons. The U.S. investigators, the FBI, the Justice Department, say there is no doubt that your two sons were on the plane that crashed into the World Trade Center. That's what they believe. That's their opinion. But I don't see any hard evidence to prove that my sons were involved in that crash. What is it about the culture these men grew up in that could have spawned such bigotry and hatred? I spoke with three university students who were schooled in the same southern province as four of the hijackers. We'd rather not shake hands. I understand that. I have a copy of a textbook. It says if you look into any crisis, Jewish people have a role to play. Have you been taught this, that Jews are behind yes. the yes. crises? You have been taught this? Yes. Do you, in general, feel that the Jewish people in history are, are people who are essentially bad people and cause problems? Do you feel that, Mohammed? Yes, I feel. And these are the educated young men. This is an opportunity for you to talk to Americans, perhaps American young people like yourself. I want to tell them that we did not hate them, but please don't support enemies uh, against Muslims. If you respect me, for sure I respect you. And if you hate me, I'll hate you. And we're still trying to understand. 2020 gave me the opportunity to travel the world and to meet many of its leaders. Coming up in the next hour, America's leaders, presidents and first ladies, and some of the hottest celebrities, also some women at the center of the greatest scandals. You lifted the back of your jacket and you showed the president of the United States your thong underwear. I mean, who does that? Next. There's much more to come in the next hour of Barbara Walters' most memorable career moments. This may be hard for people to um, hear or accept. I thought he was my sexual soulmate. So, so Barbara, I'm very happy, yes. When are you going to get married? I think that's the end of this interview. <laughs> When 25 on 2020 continues after this from our ABC station. I hope you're a good driver. You know what you're doing, I hope.
Are you sorry you didn't bring the tapes? I wonder what have the White House years meant to your marriage? There is the big question. How could you stay in this marriage? Are you afraid you're an alcoholic? Arnold Schwarzenegger, governor of California. Huh? Hmm? Maybe? You still collect knives. In my first sexual relationship, I brought knives out. And are you crazy? I believed I was from another planet. I think I was insane. Does he hit you? He shakes. He pushes. He, um... He swings. Did you try to kill your wife? Did you kill your daughter? Did you kill your wife? I'm just a normal kid. Oh, Eric, you're a normal kid who killed your parents. You showed the President of the United States your wow. thong underwear. Where did you get the nerve? I mean, who does it? <laughs> you could be sent to prison. Are you scared? Who wouldn't be scared? The doctor says you have Parkinson's. What did you think? I said, this is not going to be boring. Begin to see there is a future. You pull out and go, man, am I lucky. I am so lucky. It's unbelievable. Good evening, and welcome to the second of two special hours we call 25 on 2020, or a uh, retrospective of my hairstyles. After 25 years appearing as co-anchor in this program, I felt it was time for me to move on to a new chapter, which I'll tell you more about later. Over the next hour, you're going to meet celebrities, some of them a bit odd. We'll also talk with America's presidents and their wives. But first, two young women who almost destroyed the lives of two very powerful men. My conversation with one of them turned out to be probably the most watched news interview of all time. Can you guess who it was? I did not have sexual relations with that woman. President Clinton famously denied his 18-month relationship with Monica Lewinsky. After the secret was uncovered, Lewinsky found herself under investigation by special prosecutor Kenneth Starr. He threatened her with jail time unless she told the truth about the relationship. Did you give him a letter of offering full immunity? I'm not going to comment. I had only met Monica Lewinsky once before she agreed to do her first interview. She was up to her neck in legal debts and was offered large amounts of money to sell her story. But she decided that her credibility in this country was more important. At the time of our interview, no one had heard her side of the story, sordid details and all. You found yourself alone with Bill Clinton in the chief of staff's office and you lifted the back of your jacket and you showed the president of the United States your thong <laughs> underwear. Where did you get the nerve? I mean, who does that? <laughs> I'm sure as you know and everybody who has ever been in any situation where there's flirtation, it's, it's a dance. And it's sort of one person does something and then do you meet that person and raise the stakes? And that was how our flirtation relationship was progressing. Was it saying I'm available? No, I don't think it was saying I'm available. I think it was saying I'm interested too. I'll play. Weeks, sometimes months would go by without your seeing him. Twice he tried to break up with you. I mean, after being treated that way, why didn't you walk away? I wanted to a lot of times. Where was your self-respect? Where was your self-esteem? I don't have the feelings of self-worth that a woman should have. And that's hard for me and I think that's been a center of a lot of my mistakes and a lot of my pain. What would you tell your children when you have them? Mommy made a big mistake. Did she ever? After this interview, I heard especially from many female viewers who wanted one important question answered, and that was, what was that lipstick Monica was wearing? For the record, it was called Glaze from Club Monaco, and after our interview, sales of Glaze skyrocketed. But Monica Lewinsky was not the first woman to jeopardize a political career. 
We want new directions and a new vision. His name was Gary Hart. Her name was Donna Rice. A year before the 1988 election, Senator Gary Hart was a shoo-in for the Democratic presidential nomination. But when Hart, who was married, was caught spending the night with Rice, a young aspiring model, his bid for the presidency was over. Now, clearly under present circumstances, this campaign cannot go on. A few weeks later, an embarrassing photo surfaced of the two of them on a yacht called Monkey Business. Monkey Business, indeed. It has been the most difficult, painful, and humiliating experience. And um, it's been really tough. When you heard that Gary Hart was no longer going to be a presidential candidate, how would you feel? I feel it's a tragedy. don't quite understand it. I'm responsible for my own actions, and I admit that there's been a lack of judgment on my part. What everyone wants to know, of course, is did you or did you not sleep with Gary Hart? Do you want to answer me? No, I don't want to answer you. But the reason is because it's a question of dignity. Whether I did, whether I didn't, with Gary Hart or anybody else, I wouldn't answer it one way or the other. Donna Rice never did answer that question. She never wrote a book. She turned down television office to speak out and retreated into private life. At one point, serving on a government task force fighting internet pornography. The undefeated, undisputed. Moving from the political ring to the boxing ring. Heavyweight champion of the world. Mike Tyson was known for knocking his opponents unconscious. But he himself took a fall outside the ring. And I was in part involved. In 1988, Tyson had married actress Robin Givens. In September of that year, Givens prodded her husband to sit for a joint interview. She had something to tell me. Mike Tyson, she said, was not only violent in the ring, he was also violent at home. To deny his wife's allegations or to get up and storm out. But he just sat there, passively listening. The interview was a bombshell, and the day after it aired, Tyson threw a chair through a window of their house. Robin Givens filed for divorce. For most of us, it was nearly impossible to contemplate. The art of entertaining means being creative. Martha Stewart, a paragon of perfection, facing prosecution for obstruction of justice, conspiracy, and making false statements. Before her trial, she sat down with me and answered even the most difficult questions. This was the toughest for both of us, but it had to be asked. You know, there are a few people, men or women, who seem to be as much of a lightning rod as you are. You bring out the most profound emotions in people. Martha, why do so many people hate you? Well, I like to think that each and every one of us has people that love us and people that hate us. I think that's just human nature. No, not everybody has people who hate them. Well, the people who you think hate me uh, don't know me. I'm not perfect. But this past July, after being found guilty on all counts, Martha Stewart was sentenced to five months in prison and five months house arrest. Just hours after her sentencing, Stewart came to ABC for another interview. I have been ca categorized time in and time out um, uh, as, as a arrogant, yeah. powerful, hugely rich, successful businesswoman. I've worked for 62 years, Barbara. I didn't become rich overnight. And to be maligned and maliciously attacked and, and brought down to the level that I've been brought down to is not really all my fault. And this was the most shameful, shameful day in my life, in my family's life, in my, my co-workers' lives. It's a shameful day. By all accounts, Martha Stewart is handling her public shame with dignity. Her lawyers are appealing her case. The interview with Martha Stewart was a scoop.
And in this business, the scoop, uh, the get, as we call it, is not just about getting the big interview, but getting it first. That's something I've often tried to do. When we come back, some gets for maximum security. They took away my entire past. They took away my entire future. What's left for them to take? You gonna take my testicles and make earrings out of them? Next. When you dress in black and have to wear veils, does this bother you? Sometimes I consider my robe as a bless. I'll just put it on. A uniform. Exactly, just slip it on and throw it. I see all kinds of things being sold for women. Do you buy those clothes? Yes, yes, we do. You should see us in boxes. Yeah, what do you look like when this comes off? Miss Universe. <laughs> no, I bet you do. <laughs> During the past 25 years, I've talked with some of the most infamous killers and accused murderers. Perhaps two of the most unlikely murderers were attractive Ivy League children of privilege, Beverly Hills brothers, Eric and Lyle Menendez. Eric and Lyle Menendez confessed to savagely killing their parents in 1989. Their first trial was broadcast live on national television, and they told a rapt courtroom that they had been in fear for their lives from a father who had been sexually abusing them. My dad... My dad had been molesting me. I find that the jury is hopelessly deadlocked. This and, trial uh, ended in a mistrial, mistrial, but their second trial ended in conviction. And before they were sentenced in 1996, for the first time outside the courtroom, the brothers told their story. Tell me as clearly as you can why you murdered your parents that night. The brothers are serving life sentences without parole in separate prisons. But to some, their story of child abuse struck a chord. And remarkably, despite their sentences, Eric and Lyle Menendez both married in prison. Eric Menendez married Tammy, a woman who wrote to him in prison after his conviction. What kind of woman would marry a man serving a life sentence? You're a pretty woman. You leave Minnesota. You had other men that you could have married. Why on earth would you change your whole life for Eric Menendez? He's the most sensitive, kind, I mean, he's just, he's always there for me. He worries, you know, I, I never had that before. Have you ever had sex with Eric? No. Your marriage has never been consummated? No. It's not a problem for me. I, um, it's, uh, it's just not a problem for me at all. What do you say to people who say, Tammy Menendez, you are... Nuts. Um, well, I just feel that they do not understand, but I, I am happy. I, I love my life right now. The great spectacle surrounding the Menendez case was surpassed okay, in 1995 going. by the most sensational murder trial of the past decade. The defendant, of course, O.J. Simpson, accused and then acquitted of the murder of his ex-wife, Nicole, and her friend, Ron Goldman. I remember I was actually on the air for 2020 when the word came that Simpson was in a white Bronco being chased by the police. You were looking at scenes of a chase on a car that they, it, it is presumed O.J. Simpson is in. Despite all the attention given to Nicole Simpson, not much was then known about the other victim, Ron Goldman. His father, Fred, called me and said he wanted the world to know about his son. And so I sat down with him, Ron's sister Kim, and the rest of the family. You know, when this first happened, and it was Nicole Simpson and a, a male companion, your son, a male companion. A friend, a waiter. I was yelling at the TV, Ron, his name is Ron. He has a name, he has a family, he got a life. Nine months later, during the trial, we spoke again. How would you feel if O.J. Simpson were acquitted? Angrier than hell. I think if, I would move. If he were acquitted, it would go against country. everything that I believe in. It's, it's just almost incomprehensible as that could happen. 
But the jury disagreed, and for the Goldman family, the incomprehensible... Ron, a waiter. I was yelling at the TV, Ron, his name is Ron. He has a name, he has a family, he got a life. Nine months later, during the trial, we spoke again. How would you feel if O.J. Simpson were acquitted? Angrier than hell. I think if, I would move. If he were acquitted, it would go against country. everything that I believe in. It's just, it's just almost incomprehensible as that could happen. But the jury disagreed, and for the Goldman family, the incomprehensible happened. He's not guilty of the crime of murder. The verdict provoked strong reactions on both sides, and on the day of the acquittal, I interviewed one of O.J. Simpson's chief lawyers, Robert Shapiro, who broke with his co-counsel, Johnny Cochran, and spoke out against the controversial role that race played in the trial. Barbara, my position was always the same, that race would not and should not be a part of this case. I was wrong. Not only did we play the race card, we dealt it from the bottom of the deck. The O.J. Simpson case proved that when an accused murderer is a celebrity, the interest is even more intense. That was certainly the case when Robert Blake, the 71-year-old star of the 1970s TV series Beretta, was charged with the murder of his wife. Two of his attorneys quit over his decision to speak publicly, but he defied them. After 10 months in isolation, he was tearful, defiant, sad, and angry. Robert, are you innocent? Of course, well, of course I'm innocent. Of course I'm innocent. Did you kill your wife? Of course not. Okay. What if you were found guilty? What do I care? How do you kill a dead man? Where have you been for two years? Okay. So you think that you're going to be found guilty? No. I'm not going to be found guilty. Why? It's real simple. Because God has never, ever deserted me. One month after our interview, Blake was granted bail. When we come back, from one extreme to the other, from prisoners to presidents. Have you given your husband any advice uh, during this campaign? I really don't think George wants a lot of advice for, uh -huh. for me. That's not true. I don't want a lot of advice from him. <laughs> Next. One of the wonderful things about doing this interview with you is that I no longer have to say to you, so when you're getting married, <laughs> That's really which I was doing an interview I after know, interview. I know, I said, Barbara, I'll do your show, but don't ask me that question anymore. You said that we grew up together. Mm -hmm. I've seen the difference. So, Thank Barbara, very happy, yeah? when are you going to get married? I think that's the end of this interview. <laughs> me too. <laughs> Some of you younger viewers may think that I have interviewed every president since Abraham Lincoln. Wrong. Only since Richard Nixon. He, of course, was the president who lost his job because of a scandal called Watergate. I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. Richard Nixon resigned in disgrace in August of 1974, having served six years as president, done in by audio tapes he had secretly recorded in the Oval Office. When the tapes were subpoenaed by Congress, they proved Nixon knew about the Watergate break-in. I had done several interviews with President Nixon while he was in office, but the most difficult was the one I conducted after he left office. This was his first live interview, and I don't know which one of us was more nervous. I asked the question I think everyone wanted answered. Are you sorry you didn't burn the tapes? Yes, I think so, because they were private conversations subject to misinterpretation, as we have all seen. After Richard Nixon, Jerry Ford's amiable personality was welcome. Jimmy Carter seemed amiable, too, at least on the surface. How you mean? Do you have a cold, hard, mean streak? Do those blue eyes get cold and tough? Well, I, I'm mean enough to protect myself <laughs> and to win if I'm in a, in a battle, but I try to do it legitimately. 
For the first President Bush, the issue was credibility. Are you sorry that you ever said, read my lips, no new taxes? I'm not sorry in the sense of trying to hold the line on taxes, but I think it, it caused a credibility problem uh, at the time, and I, so I would have to rank that as not a howling success, put it that way. Are you all right, Mr. President? Oh, yeah. Get wet. Fine. I can get a little wet. And with Bill Clinton, the question was character. It was an issue even in the 1996 campaign, well before the Monica Lewinsky scandal. Mr. President, character is said to be a major issue in this campaign. How important is it for the president to be a role model? I think it's important for the president to be a role model as a leader for the country, uh, to, to stick up for the things that the country ought to believe in and be for. The American people have now had an adequate opportunity to judge me as president, to see my work, to make a judgment about whether I have the character to do this job, and uh, they will do that. For our current president, one difficult question was about his past behavior. You have said that you stopped drinking cold turkey at the age of 40. Now, I, I won't pursue why you stopped, but do you know why you were drinking in the first place? Did you ever think about that? That's a really interesting question. Of all the times I've been asked about that question, you're the first who's ever put it that way. Probably because I like the way it tasted. <laughs> the President of the United States of America is the most powerful man in the world. But even in the White House, there are limits to power. Oh, hey, hey, little man. Here, little man. Oh, oh, little man. Little man. Hi, Barney. Notice how he comes right to you. Yes, well, <laughs> right to you. Well, hey, come here, Barney. Yes. Hey, he certainly boy. does listen to you. <laughs> yeah, my little fellow, well-tamed, well-trained yeah. man. In addition to presidents, I've had a chance to interview almost every first lady, starting with Mamie Eisenhower. When she was in the White House, she was often accused of being a drinker, and she cleared up the rumors. You had trouble with your ear, yes. your inner ear. And I couldn't walk a straight line, and everybody thought I was inebriated. And this would happen at 9 o'clock in the morning. You don't drink at all now, do you? I don't drink a thing. Nothing. I never do. Unlike Mamie Eisenhower, the first time I interviewed Betty Ford in the White House, she was sadly inebriated. This is the most personal room in the White House, isn't it? Yes. Uh, Barbara, I fixed this room for him. I brought things for, uh, from home. I had to cut out most of the interview. It was unusable. But then Betty Ford, with the help of her family, turned her life around. She founded a world-class center for the treatment of alcoholism and addiction. Thirteen years after leaving the White House, a sober and reflective Betty Ford sat down with me to discuss for the first time her struggle with addiction. I couldn't remember anything. Telephone calls from one day to the next, plans we had. I wouldn't remember having heard about them. So if you have physical pain, you take a pill. If you have emotional pain, you take a little drink. I used the pills and the alcohol to help me cope. Um, it, it was like an anesthetic. Betty Ford rose above her pain to help other people with theirs. So did Barbara Bush. When you came back from China, yeah. where George Bush served really as an ambassador, when you came back, you went into a terrible depression. I was ashamed, and I was certainly ignorant about depression. And I was so dumb, I didn't ask for help. And George was the only one who knew I had it, and he would say, why don't you get some help? You even write that you had thoughts of suicide. Well, not quite, you said you but I had thought thoughts... of driving into a tree. Yes. Okay. Well, that's I pretty had serious well, business. Well, it was pretty serious, and now when I hear about depression, instead of saying, oh, pull yourself together, mm -hmm. yep. which is what I used to think, I now think, well, that's tough, and, and you've got to get help. And with at least two of the first ladies, the difficult questions were about the relationship with their husband. The first was Lady Bird Johnson. Someone once said that being married to Lyndon Johnson must have been like living on the end of a runway. How did you keep your own self, your own persona? Barbara, it was a different world then. You didn't worry about that. This was your husband. You lived his life pretty much. Yeah. I read that you brought your husband his coffee and his newspapers in bed, that you shined his shoes. <laughs> I mean, there I are... soon found a more competent shoe shiner. When Hillary Clinton wrote her autobiography last year, she had to write about her husband's infidelity. 
He just kept saying that he was very sorry over and over again. And I could tell that he was, but that wasn't much comfort. I was still furious and um, stayed furious for quite some time. But he just kept saying over and over again, you know, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And why did the marriage survive? You know, he's like a force of nature. He is so overwhelming. And I knew I loved him. I knew I was in love with him. I knew that there wasn't anyone who made me happier, that I had more fun with, that I found more interesting. There are times when I'm asked of all the interviews I've done with presidents, which one has stayed in my mind? That would have to be my 1981 interview with Ronald Reagan on his very private ranch with his now famous Jeep. I don't want to hurt your feelings, but this is the scroungiest Jeep. I have the upholstery is coming out. I mean, I know we have an austerity program, but this is ridiculous. I can see that. I've always believed that there was some plan that put this continent here to be found by people from every corner of the world who had the courage and the love of freedom enough to uproot themselves, leave family and friends and homeland to come here and develop a whole new breed of people called American. You look at the beauty of it and God really did shed his grace on America, as the song says. Still to come. Let's go to a night that changed your life. I saw the most ravishing woman I had ever seen in my life standing across the room. Her name was Ellen DeGeneres. You wrote in your book it was the best sex you ever had. Better than with any man? Yep. When 25 on 2020 continues after this from our ABC stations. Is there anyone in your life right now? No, no, my boy is not allowed. Sorry, my Mike, not you're, not answer directing, answer. you're not directing my interview. He was ready to answer. I just said no. You no. said no. <laughs> if you say no, no look me in the eye. Don't be a con man. <laughs> Con, don't be a con man. <laughs> I'm a con man now. The answer is really no. The right? answer is really no. I accept that. After so many years of interviewing celebrities, it takes an awful lot to shock me. Who ever thought that would happen with a fragile blonde actress named Anne H? Until we spoke in 2001, Anne was best known for her lesbian relationship with Ellen DeGeneres, which had broken up. She had just written her autobiography, in which she said that her father had sexually abused her, and as a result, she became two distinct personalities. Anne's autobiography was aptly titled, Call Me Crazy. You wrote in your book that you were insane. Those are your words, mm -hmm. insane for 31 years. You're 32 now. I had another personality. I had a fantasy world that I escaped to. I called my other personality Celestia. I called the other world that I created for myself the fourth dimension. I believed I was from that world. I believed I was from another planet. I think I was insane. I spoke a different language that God and I spoke together. Can you still remember that language you spoke? Of course. Can you do any of it? I can ask, I can forget to not done. I was, in my mind, learning it from God. That was three years ago. Today, Anne says her personal revelations have helped her achieve mental balance. She is now a successful actress, married with a two-year-old son. Another actress who had a reputation for being bizarre was Angelina Jolie. For our interview in 2003, Angelina was famous for being very weird and very wild. Who could ever forget her strange marriage to actor Billy Bob Thornton, both of them wearing vials of each other's blood. We had been told Angelina didn't want to discuss her past, but when we spoke, she kept nothing back. She even admitted to a childhood obsession with death and a fascination with knives that led to her cutting herself. My first sexual relationship, I brought knives out 
and had a night where we attacked each other and was so stupid because I have one right here next right next to my jugular vein oh, wow. and I have I have them still everything changed for Angelina the day she adopted a Cambodian orphan she named Maddox I think when you make a decision to have a child you you cannot be you can't think about suicide again you can't be self-destructive you can't decide to go out and get drunk and but you can't so you've made a decision you're a parent what a difference this child has made it's really given you a sense of self hasn't it yeah yeah or selflessness <laughs> it was no surprise to me that arnold schwarzenegger finally became governor of california after all i'd been asking him about it for years arnold schwarzenegger governor of california huh hmm? maybe it's not in my goal right now really i think when the time is right I would do it. When? When, for instance, there is a real lack of leadership in, in my state, in California. That moment arrived last summer, and Arnold quickly terminated his opponents. Because you were born in Austria, you could not run for president. Right. You're a very ambitious man, and you always had lofty goals. Would you have wanted to be president? I would have liked to be the leader of the world. <laughs> <laughs> A music legend for all generations is Elton John. We first met a decade ago in England for my specials. He was brutally honest with me that day about the alcohol and drug addiction that had controlled his life for so many years. Somebody that I was um, in a relationship with from America, he said that I was a drug addict, that I was an alcoholic, that I was a bulimic. I was a liar, and I sat there and I was trembling and I cried and I said, yeah, you're right, I'll go, I'll, go, I'll get help. Elton got the help he needed and we have remained friends ever since. We talked again this past February for 2020. His one-man show was getting rave reviews in Las Vegas. How is this Elton I'm talking to today different from that fellow I met 10 years ago? I think I'm much more wise. I think yeah. I'm, there's a lot happened in, now it's 13 years, 13 and a half years sober and clean. My sobriety has brought me everything that I could possibly wish for. 10 years ago, Elton played one of his timeless tunes for me. Easily hide. I get to this next line and I always burst, I secretly laugh inside. I don't have much money. <laughs> Times have changed. Boy, if I did. And now, a decade later, he played it again on his red piano. We both could live. Its title is Your Song, but I'm starting to think of it as my song. But then again, no. Or a man who makes potions in a, a traveling show. I know it's not much, but it's the best I can do. My gift and my song, and this one's for you. Madame, pour toi. Mm, thank you. When 2020 returns... I never had a moment where I fell to my knees and said, you know, oh, God, this is horrible. I said, this is going to be an interesting journey. This is not going to be boring. Next. So I sit here for the family portrait. You all look very normal. <laughs> How do you do it? How do you raise these kids in the life that you've led, a public life, all this money, how did you keep them from being the most awful spoiled brats, or are they? Well, they are spoiled brats, there's no question about that. But you know, they're basically good kids. One of the things that I've always said to the kids, no smoking, no drinking, no drugs. Like I said, I've never had a drink, but... Um, you, you should know, never I, have had a drink. I, I hope you don't drink anymore, I'll tell you. I'm, I'm learning things on the show. Thank you, Barbara. <laughs> occasionally ask, 
who was the most memorable person I've ever interviewed? Well, it isn't a president or a movie star. It's a man named Bob Smithus, whom I first interviewed more than 30 years ago when I was on the Today Show. I never forgot him. And years later, when I heard he had married, I wanted to see him again and introduce him on 2020. Bob Smithus is a teacher, a poet, has a master's degree and two honorary doctorates, and he has been deaf and blind since the age of four. His wife, Michelle, is also deaf and blind. They both teach other people like themselves. This is the only interview I've ever done where my interview subjects couldn't hear my questions. I spoke to this remarkable couple with the help of interpreters who relayed my words to them via fingerspelling. Bob and Michelle. You have never actually seen each other. Bob, tell me what your wife looks like. First of all, she is petite and rather delicate. She has delicate bone structure. She has a very sweet disposition. I think that is what brought us together. Michelle, how did you meet Bob? In the hallway, I was walking. Very slowly, I was being careful. Here he was, walking. I did not see him, no, no. Bang! <laughs> Before I knew it, he cut me. <laughs> That's how we met. <laughs> you literally banged into him. Yes. <laughs> so as they say, love by first sight, for us it was love by touch or by feeling. Imagine cooking by touch, slicing onions in the dark, not being able to see the flame on the stove. Michelle, do you ever say, why me? Or do you think this happened for a reason? No, I do not question it. I should say that I am rather happy for what I am able to do and for what I have. <laughs> No wonder they have stayed in my mind all these years. Even people with so-called charmed lives have shown their mettle when confronted with challenging circumstances. I just feel like I've been in God's pocket for so long that I just didn't think that I was going to be hammered with this, that, 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 that I would find a way to, to, to live with it, to learn from it, to, to deal with it, and, and I have. I was saddened, as was the whole country, when Michael J. Fox revealed that he had a nerve disorder, Parkinson's disease. In 1998, he appeared on 2020 to speak publicly about this ordeal for the first time. What did you think? You're 30 years old and the doctor says you have Parkinson's. I, I, I was shocked and it, it, it frightened me. And what did you say to yourself? I said, you know, I said, this is going to be an interesting journey. This is not going to be boring. You don't dwell on this, do you? It's pointless to dwell on it. It's absolutely pointless to dwell on it. It's like worrying about what the weather's going to be like tomorrow. You don't consider this a tragedy? Not by any stretch of the imagination. It's my life. It's my life, and it's, my life is so filled with positives and so filled with blessings and so filled with things that, that I wouldn't trade for anything in the world. Christopher Reeve. Superman of movie fame, what irony. This fine actor and great athlete became immobilized from the neck down in a horseback riding accident in 1995. I did the first interview with him four months after the accident. I had no idea what to expect. I found a man whose body was paralyzed, but whose mind and spirit soared. And you think you will walk again? I think it's very possible I'll walk again. And if you don't? Then I won't walk again. As simple as that. Either you do or you don't. I just play the hand you're dealt. Sometimes you get a lot of face cards, sometimes you don't. But I think the game's worthwhile. I really do. I have now done five interviews with Christopher Reeves since his accident, and I've seen the changes in him, and I've watched him make progress that doctors thought was impossible. With intense physical therapy, 
Reeve has regained some sensation in his body and some movement in his fingers, wrists, and legs. In this most recent interview done last year, he was also finally able to breathe on his own without a respirator. I have never talked to you without I've never ventilator. done this in public. This is the first time. And I'll just listen for a minute to the quiet. See, back to normal, and I can talk. I don't know what to say. All these interviews you and I have done, and now you are breathing on your own. You've not been able to smell all these years. Uh, right, not for eight years. <sighs> Coffee. Coffee, very good. I have a rose. You've not been able to smell this before. No. Let's see. Mmm, yes. It's beautiful. You know, many of us in the morning feel, oh, I don't want to get out of bed, I don't want to face the day. You know, what do you say to yourself when you feel that way? Being physically paralyzed for eight years. I get pretty impatient with people who are able-bodied, but are somehow paralyzed for other reasons. You know, all the reasons people don't become what they could become or don't, uh, fulfill their potential and they're walking around able-bodied. I'm going, come on, come on, go for it. Oh, Chris, what an inspiration you are. So why am I going when I've had such a satisfying time on 2020? Stay tuned. So, it's been 25 years on 2020, and I have been blessed. I've had my heart moved and my mind expanded. But a friend of mine once gave me a ring inscribed, I did that already, and I kind of feel that way. But I'm hardly saying goodbye to television. I'm leaving the anchor chair on 2020 to devote more time to specials, to pick and choose the subjects that most interest me. And I'll still be on The View, and even on 2020, from time to time. Next week, I'm going to turn over my anchor chair to Elizabeth Vargas, who will have the fun of working with John Stossel. But this moment is about saying thank you, especially to you, our viewers, and to all of the people over all these years who let me prod them with questions. I thank you all. You always call me Miss Hepburn, and I call you Barbara. So why don't you shift and call me Kate? I like that. Thank you, Kate. You're still a very handsome man. Thank you very much. I can much. still flirt with you. Thank you. <laughs> you were one of the most honest, open, outspoken people I've talked to. And I thank you for doing this interview with me. Thank you very much. Even with my eyes closed, there's one thing I know. You are a beautiful man. Thank you. Great to see you again. It's great to see you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Bush. Thank you. Thank you for being with us, Mr. Nixon. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Thank you, President Carter. It's nice to see you again. It's great to be with you, Paula. Would you like to try I would love to try it. Okay. Okay. Don't get me fingered on oh. Okay, fine. Get it in the light. Well, thanks a lot, Elizabeth. The interview's over. We're Thank you, Celine. Thank you, and it's very nice to see you again. I love seeing you. Thank you, Miss Polly, for this remarkable interview. I, I, I'd say thank you back, but it's a lot. <laughs> I love you, darling. Mm, thank you. God bless you. God bless you. I think we're done. I'm obviously keeping Camille awake. <laughs> I've been dying to get out of this chair.
News, honored with five Emmy Awards for excellence in reporting. More than NBC, more than CBS. No wonder more Americans get their news right here. ABC News. Vikings, Eagles, Monday night, 9 Eastern, 6 Pacific on ABC. Mike says get ready for a sun-filled weekend. Also, a Jackson family affair as Brother Michael faces his accuser's mother in court. And the taste of Maxwell Street Market.